السلام عليكم ورحمة الله uh, يعني I'm assuming uh, I'm live now I'm just uh, trying to uh, أتأكد كده من المجموعة الأدمنز إنه أنا لايف على الـ على الجروب دلوقتي في الـ طيب أنا أعتقد إنه باي تشيكينج على التليفون عندي أنا شايف إن أنا لايف أتمنى تكون الصورة واضحة وإحنا قعدنا Uh, we tried uh, a lot to make the el- streaming as as best as possible. Yeah, uh, دلوقتي أنا uh, يعني it's a new way of streaming. فأنا هشوف بعض الكومنتات من الأدمنز ونشوف كده يعني أنا شايف الجميل جدا. أنا شايف الكلام الكومنتات إن الصورة كويسة وال طيب ممتاز uh, هنبدا اللايف ستريمنج ان شاء الله اند سين ام نوت شور يعني هاو ماني على الجروب كود بي جاست انجلش سبيكينج انا عارف ان دي الفيرست ايجيبشن جروب بس ستيل سينز لايك سم بيبل ار نوت بس من ايجيبت فيعني uh, يعني uh, هكون على قد ما اقدر Uh, تكون الصورة إن شاء الله uh, تكون الكلام يعني بال, بالإنجليش مينلي بس أشوف اللايف معايا هنا عشان أقدر أتحكم طيب ممتاز uh, حلوة uh, And I, I mean, uh, so I'm, I'm going to try to to speak actually in English, just in case there are some people who are just uh, yeah, English speakers. But then, uh, anyway, يعني, I think that in, uh, in the English, I can be perfect with you all, inshallah. So let's uh, start the, the presentation. I hope that everyone will be in good health and stay home order is something new to all of us. So... Um, Uh, it, it's a new thing in life that I didn't even think it's going to happen uh, throughout my life. So everybody, uh, I think it's a new experience for everybody. Uh, yeah, and you probably remember we should have had uh, a Middle East Academy meeting uh, by the end of March, yeah, last March, but it was postponed until October. Uh, inshallah, we'll see you there. Uh, anyway, now let's start the uh, presentation. Now I'm going to talk about the reliable anatomical landmarks in stoic sinus surgery. Uh, and uh, we are not going to talk about the very basics of the basics, which means we are, we are not going to talk about the onset process, for example. We're not going to talk about uh, the small details. We really going to go through the anatomical landmarks that you need as a surgeon in the complex cases or difficult situations or revision cases. Uh, or just de novo cases anyway, but you need some landmarks to define for you a roadmap to go through the endoscopic sinus surgery, hopefully safely and effectively. Uh, uh, by the way, this is a lecture that uh, it's part of the lectures that we actually give in the our biannual endoscopic sinus surgery course in, uh, in, in Dubai. Uh, the, the last one was postponed because, again, of the corona issue. Uh, but I, I, can, I cannot uh, post this picture without uh, mentioning, of course, Professor, Professor Stenberger, uh, that I had the honor to work with, uh, with him uh, for years in this endoscopic sinus surgery course in Dubai. Uh, and we always remember his achievements and uh, his, you know, all what he, his teachings in the field Uh, let me just check the message from. Uh, okay, so I think uh, Muhammad Rantisi is saying everything is fine. So I can't just, I cannot just uh, go, yeah, and post this picture without remembering him and, uh, uh, you know, just uh, have all the thoughts with his achievements in this field and the teachings that he added to this field 
Uh, and again, the honor that I had and the experience that I, I actually got by uh, joining him in this course uh, for years. Uh, now, for endoscopic sinus surgery, endoscopic sinus surgery, while doing it, you are you are focusing in two things: is performing a safe endoscopic sinus surgery and an effective procedure as well. Now, why is that? Because if you do an endoscopic sinus surgery uh, safely, it can be safe, but not as effective. For example, by leaving behind a lot of the polyps, a lot of the disease, uh, and by doing so, by by the way, it's not actually safe because you ex you exposing the patient to more hazards in the revision cases. Uh, in the revision scenario, uh, exposing the patient sometimes to adhesions or with, with safe is not actually cannot maybe not may not be actually safe. And an effective endoscopic sinus surgery means you perform it, uh, uh, so you can be effective. You can be effective by removing all the disease, but at the same time, you you go through the lamina or the skull base, so you are not. You are not literally safe, uh, although you are you have all the disease and all that stuff. So you have to focus on both things and, and to perform it safe and effectively. And at the end of the procedure, then you will feel happy, excited about what you have achieved in the procedure, and you'll see your team uh, as well. In order to do so, uh, you need to understand the anatomy very well. Now, what I mean by uh, what I mean by the anatomy uh, is the anatomy. Not, not from like the anatomy that you we have learned in the medical school, but but really the anatomy from uh, the endoscopic perspective, from the surgical perspective that you are operating on. And that's why, uh, by the way, I started my endoscopic career by, you know, having this uh, scholarship uh, with uh, Dr. Cassiano. And uh, this has changed my, you know, career back in 2005 when I started this. My focus was uh, to do an endoscopic cyanonasal dissection a lot. Uh, we ended by like by 50, 50 plus endoscopic cyanonasal dissections, uh, which enabled us to understand the anatomy very well, all the uh, details, describe the, the relationships, landmarks, uh, and all that stuff. And uh, you know, and we we, we have worked as a team. So uh, in the endoscopic sinus, this dissection manual. Uh, so that was the first publication in 2011, along with uh, uh, Amy Anderson, Adam, Lori, and Bilaccio, and, uh, and uh, our mentor, Cassiano. And, uh, and then we then republished this with so many editions in the 2017 uh, edition that you also have uh, on Amazon right now, I guess, or, you know, on the theme website. Uh, a lot of you already have it as well. And uh, you will find in this out of the details that we are going to be speaking today and also throughout the skull base uh, sections as well. Uh, so that's the, the way for you to understand that with the is to do a lot of dissections uh, in this regard. Now, when we, we will see as well that the endoscopic goes side by side with the radiologic anatomy. So you study all the radiology, and, and basically this is what we are doing in endoscopic sinus surgery. We are reviewing the radiology very well, and then we are applying this to what we see endoscopically, so uh, it goes together. And when you have uh, a map in your mind with the, of the radiology that you see with certain landmarks that we're, we're going to describe right now, you can perform actually the endoscopy as, as just as uh, if you have a, a navigation machine beside you. Now, it doesn't mean that the navigation is not necessary. It just means that for most of the basic and the extended procedures, you can have a, a map inside your mind tells you what exactly to do uh, in the surgery. Uh, uh, this is a picture that I always present uh, in the beginning of the lectures. Uh, just to remind people about this misunderstanding. Uh, you see this, uh, what's, what do you think? It'll just give, you, uh, uh, give yourself a second uh, uh, to think what is wrong in this picture, I'm sure. If some of you have attended some of our lectures before, you will know that, uh, that what's wrong here is the superior turbinate. So the superior turbinate is, is not really, the, the turbinates are not really like, uh, like uh, uh, ladders, just simple, inferior, middle, and superior like this. But actually, the superior and the middle turbinate have this arrangement. They are not separate. They are not separate in the upper part. As you see, the, the superior turbinate and the middle turbinate are actually 
one thing in the upper part of the field attached to the skull piece, and this part is called uh, the conchal plate. You see this? This part is called uh, the conchal plate, right? So you see the conchal plate is one thing, uh, and it's the upper part of the superior and the middle terminates. And as we go inferiorly, the superior and the middle terminate, the superior and the middle terminate are actually separating uh, from each other. Uh, let me check if I can hide this. Hopefully I can. Okay, so just, okay. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, as you see, they are actually uh, separated as we go inferiorly uh, to form the superior and the middle term, and sometimes as well the supreme uh, term. Now we have, on the other hand, we have the inferior term as a, a separate bone attached to the lateral uh, nasal wall. As you see this also from the endoscopic view. So uh, we are now looking at the right side, and this is the inferior term on the right side, that's the middle turbinate, and that's a superior turbinate. And as you see, they are separating to into uh, superior and middle turbinate as you go inferiorly, but the upper part is one thing which is called uh, the conchal plate. And this is obviously the sphenoid uh, ostium. So the superior, middle, and the inferior. And, uh, and this conchal plate is important because it has much of the olfactory fibers that you, you, uh, that you have. And so injuring the olfactory plate will end the patient with hyposmia or even anosmia, so you don't want to go this. You don't want to go there and injure the effect, the, the conchal plate. And also the conchal plate is attached to the skull base, so you, if you injure it, you are uh, also endangering the skull base and the CSF rhinorrhea uh, for the patient. Uh, the second thing is also understanding the middle term uh, three parts. I'm sure every one of you is aware of this, so you have the sagittal part, which is attached to the skull base, and then you have the coronal uh, portion, uh, which is uh, attached uh, to the lateral nasal wall and the lamina, and then we have the uh, uh, posterior portion. By the way, uh, Mohammed Rantisi, if you hear me right now, I think I'm just receiving a message from a couple of people who just asked to join the group again, uh, maybe in the last uh, 15 minutes or something. So if you can, please approve them. Hopefully we can uh, join the, the show as well. That would be great. Thank you. Uh, so now, as you see, uh, we have also the, the horizontal portion that's attached to the lateral uh, nasal wall. Now, inferior terminate is another separate bone uh, from uh, this arrangement. What's the closer? Why I like using the closer is something that you will find by the time it gives you an excellent way to review the anatomy, both preoperatively and intraoperatively. And the closer, there is, so the closer acronym stands for different things, depending, you know, just depends on the, the one who is describing the closer. I'm going to describe the closer right now the way I like to, to teach my residents and the way I like to uh, use in the OR. So you'll find every letter of this uh, referring to certain area in the field uh, that uh, would be good to review preoperatively in the CT and the intraoperative as well. Now the closer, the C stands for the crepiform plate and the fovea if modalis. The L for the lamina papyracea. The O is the ostimator complex, uh, onodi cell and our cell as well. The S is the, the sinuses, maxillary, sphenoid, frontal. E for the ethmoid arteries. And the R to review the septum, turbinates, and the nasopharynx. First, starting with the C, uh, the, the, uh, remember the curious classification, which means you have a lateral lamella, uh, or the distance between uh, uh, the crebiform plate and the fovea ethmoidalis, which is called the lateral lamella. The lateral lam lam lamella length can range from 1 to 3 millimeter, kilos 1, 4 to 7, kilos 2, 8 to 16, uh, kilos 3. Now, that's not the whole thing. Also, remember uh, the posterior ethmoid roof. The posterior ethmoid roof also goes inferiorly as we go posteriorly. So that's an ar arrangement. Uh, that's important to remember. Now, the question is, the posterior ethmoid roof, as it goes inferiorly, uh, uh, you know, as we go backwards, how much inferiorly it's going to go? Because this is the second most common area for injury uh, during endoscopic sinus surgery, and you need to re understand where it lies in the field exactly, how much inferior. Now, you see that's posterior ethmoid roof, uh, we have 
a very fixed landmark, very helpful landmark, which is called the medial orbital floor or the MOF. And uh, uh, the question becomes how far uh, the medial or the, the ethmoid roof, the posterior ethmoid roof is going to be from the medial orbital floor. And uh, well, the first question would be how much of the cases or how, what's the percentage of the cases where uh, the posterior ethmoid roof is actually going to be at the medial orbital floor? And the answer for this is zero. Z in normal, you know, in normal conditions, uh, I don't know, not speaking about that people who have meningong fauciles or skull, skull base abnormality or something like this. I'm speaking about normal population. There is no way that the posterior ethmoid roof is going to be at the same level of the medial orbital floor. It's going to be above the medial orbital floor in all cases, even in different races. However, uh, there is uh, a distance that's going to be variable between uh, the cases. And uh, this distance, uh, well, I'm, I'm going to show, I'm going to talk about right now. So here's the thing. When you are doing unsynectomy, medial metal antrostomy, uh, you end up by creating a medial metal antrostomy. And once you do this, you see the medial orbital floor. What's the medial orbital floor at the end? It's going to be the floor of the orbit or the roof of your medial metal antrostomy. Now, this is a picture from our book. And now we are looking at uh, uh, the left side. And as you see, that's the, the level of the medial orbital floor. Uh, as we know right now, the medial orbital floor, lie, uh, the medial orbital floor lies always below the skull base of the posterior ethmoid. So if you have this as a landmark, we can just enter the posterior ethmoids through the basal lamella of the middle terminate at this level. Now remember, when you are in revision cases, when you have extensive polyps, when you have a tumor, when you have something you know that disturbs the anatomy for you, it's great to have your landmark in the field, then MOF or the medial of the flow. Let me show you this example in the video. So now we are looking at the left side, and this is the maxillary antrostomy, and now I'm putting my suction on the basal lamella of the middle turbulent at the level of the medial orbital floor. And you see the navigation Navigation is showing me that I'm, I'm going to be entering the basal lamella of the middle turbulent since I'm using this level as a landmark. I'm going to be entering through, through the basal lamella into the posterior ethmoid. And uh, why is that important? Because remember, uh, you know, there is another way to say it. There is another way is to say enter the basal lamella in through medial, right? So you can just say in through medial. The problem that lies with our residents when you are practicing the endoscopic sinus surgery in the middle of extensive disease is you are not sure, uh, you are actually not sure where in through medial is. You get this, you get this, you know, the field gets distracted, you, you get distorted, you know, you don't uh, confuse what's in through medial in the field. Uh, but using the medial of the floor is going to help you determine exactly where you are. So that's uh, now I'm entering into the posterior ethmoid. Let me check. Uh, So I'm now uh, uh, entering into the posterior ethmoid and, uh, and actually uh, uh, opening through the posterior ethmoid while starting at uh, the medial orbital floor, uh, you know. But here's one thing I want to actually also mention. Remember, if you go, that's one, one important thing here. Now, if you go with your suction tip, and instead of uh, pointing horizontally, posteriorly, you are actually uh, pointing superiorly so what you are gonna, you can end, the, you can end by getting into the skull base. Remember, so I'm talking about using the instrument in the right way, horizontally at the level of the medial orbital floor, rather than uh, pushing it superiorly into the skull base. Now, the, the, as I told you and mentioned in the beginning, the question is how far the posterior ethmoid roof is gonna be from the medial orbital floor. This is something that you need to review in the CT scan preoperatively. So there is a studies looked into that looked into that. And they showed on, you know, by the collection of studies, you will see uh, that the average is uh, around 14 millimeter. So you see this distance is around maybe 16 millimeter in this case. Uh, and you have a standard deviation of three millimeter. So remember, you can have some patient that has uh, uh, the medial orbital floor, the, the, the posterior ethmoid roof 
lying, for example, nine millimeter from the MOF. Uh, and this is called low-lying scalpies, like you have in this case. Uh, you can have it a little bit like this as well, lying a little bit more down, like eight millimeter, seven millimeter, which is an extreme in the 99th percentile or something. So you know that you have a patient with low-lying skull base uh, that you need to pay uh, attention to, okay? Uh, so, again, once you uh, use this medial orbital floor as a landmark, you can reach all the way posteriorly uh, to the sphenoid and then go from posterior to anterior along the skull base uh, in a, a safer direction since you are going to a higher skull base uh, anterior. So that's about the scalpies uh, and the cribriform plate. Now going to the lamina papyrusia. Now for the lamina papyrusia, remember that there could be dehiscence, right? But I'm pretty sure that every single one of you is reviewing uh, whether there is dehiscence in the lamina papyrusia or not preoperatively, right? So, well, that's important, but it's not the whole thing. Remember also there is position of the lamina papyrusia that we have came across during our career of endoscopic sinus surgery. I think I started looking into this back in 2010 until we published our uh, study in 2015 when we analyzed uh, hundreds of CT scans and patients to determine exactly where the position of the lamp pressure uh, uh, and, and the impact of this on the field. Let me show you this. Now the position of the laminar pressure, so that's the usual arrangement, what you see the right now is you have the millimeter and thrusting right here, and then you have a lamina papyrusia that's pretty much in the sagittal, uh, in the sagittal plane of the millimeter and thrusting that you are going to create. Okay, or you can look into the attachment of the ansonet or attachment of the lamina papyrusia into, uh, sorry, the attachment of the inferior turnet. So you see the lamina papyrusia in the same sagittal plane of this. Now that's in two thirds of cases, not in all cases. Indeed, let me check one, one second, just let me check. Uh, okay, so I think I'm still live. Uh, I am there. Yes, uh, I, I think things are fine because I, I, uh, I don't have feedback on my screen. So at least now I can see the live video on my phone as well. Now, uh, as I was just saying, that's not the whole cases. Some cases would be uh, type one, as I mentioned, two thirds, but some cases would be uh, type two, where you have the lamina papyrusia actually lying in a more medial plane relative to the sagittal plane of the medial medial antrostomy or the attachment of the inferior turnet. And uh, you can end by entering through the lamina papyrusia while you are dissecting uh, uh, these, while you are dissecting uh, um, the ethmoid cells, right? And there is also uh, type 3 lamina papyrusia, where, it's, where it actually it lies laterally, and uh, you can miss some cells on the lamina while dissecting uh, over here. Uh, you, can, you can miss some cells on the lamina if it's type 3. Let me give you this. And you think, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry I don't have a feedback, but please mention in the comments before I tell, so I can review this after uh, the broadcast. Uh, what do you think this patient is? Let me ask you. What do you think? this patient is. What type? Is it type 1? As we just mentioned, is it uh, type 2 or 3? The lamin. So I'm going to review your comments later, but hopefully some of you are going to mention the correct uh, answer. And uh, the answer is, uh, it is, uh, well, it's type 2, obviously. Since two, and the reason is we have a hypoplastic maxillary sinus, and then you see the lamina pressure uh, lies more or less uh, in a medial, as you see, it's also clear on this side. See the lamina lies medial uh, relative to the middle metal antrostomy or the attachment of the inferior turnet. And uh, then you can you have a very narrow anterior ethmoid air cells and you can enter into uh, the lamina pressure very easily. So it's type two. Uh, this is the same patient intraoperatively. So I was asking my resident, by the way, I was asking my resident to do the surgery while avoiding the lamina papyrusia, and I'm going to show you what happened with her. So she has done already the middle metal antrostomy right there. You see that this is the inferior turnet right there. And you see the lamina is there. The lamina is just in front 
of the of you as a surgeon while you are dissecting the ethmoids. And you might think this can be a cell or something, but by by but by pressing on the orbit, by pressing on the globe, you can actually see the inward movement as I just showed you, and uh, you you see this is the lamina papyrusia. And it's not a cell of the lamina papyrusia, and it has a transmission of movement. It's actually the lamina papyrusia. On the other hand, when you have uh, a lamina papyrusia that's pushed laterally, uh, and in this example also with the hessens, you you have to remember that you can have uh, cells on the lamina that you need to dissect in order to uh, clear. So I'm not sure. Okay. In order to clear uh, um, the cells, I'm actually having a lag between what I see on my phone and what I see on my screen. Uh, but we have tested this before, and I think at the end everything is going to be fine in relationship to the audio and the video on your side uh, if you have a good internet connection. So uh, I hope everything is fine. Hamad, can you send me a message confirming that everything is fine? So, okay. So as you see, you have now cells on the lamina papyrusia uh, that you see I have, I've been dissecting away from uh, the sagittal plane, away from the sagittal plane of, see, this is the sagittal, this is the millimeter antrostomy, and you see the cells are far lateral uh, to this uh, plane. And then now I'm getting into the frontal sinus, uh, clearing the skull base as well, Postoperatively, as you will see, see this is the frontal, the skull base, uh, uh, sphenoid uh, sinus, uh, posterior uh, ethmoid air cell right here that I'm going to talk about in, in 10 minutes. And then you have the millimeter antrostomy, the lamina uh, is clear uh, as well. Now, moving, so that was about the KB form and the lamina preparation. Now, moving to the osmeter complex, Onodi and our cell or the new cell that we're going to talk about. Uh, the, uh, I'm pretty sure that a lot of you already uh, know about the retromaxillary cell as well. So that's uh, now about the Haller cell. The Haller cell, we are starting, I'm starting with the Haller cell since it lies in the ostometer complex region, uh, narrowing the ostometer complex, and you might also enter the Haller cell thinking this is the maxillary, and it's not the maxillary. Uh, and the Onodi cell, which you, you would identify by, know, by uh, seeing the horizontal septum in the sphenoid sinus, right? Uh, so anything about this horizontal septum is going to be uh, the onodi cell. Uh, well, what other cell I'm going to be talking about is, uh, as I mentioned, I'm pretty sure that a lot of know, know about a lot of you know about the retromaxillary pneumatization by now, since we have published this in 2016. But I'm just going to elaborate a little bit on how it looks like in the CT scan and. Uh, what to expect uh, in revision cases as well. So we have published this uh, in by looking at, I think, uh, up to 1,000 uh, cases in, uh, in our sites uh, in this publication that we uh, did in 2016, the Y Journal, and we looked into this retro maxillary area, and then we described this pneumatization in relationship to uh, the medial wall, the lateral wall of the nose, either having type 1, or which is uh, up to 3 millimeter, or type 2, 3 to 6 millimeter, or more than 6 millimeter. Uh, and then we have compared this to the Haller cell, right? So, uh, so the, the, Haller cell, the Haller cell, basically, that I just showed you, is an anterior ethmoidal cell in the, as I just showed you, remember? I just showed you the Haller cell in the anterior ethmoid region, right? In the anterior ethmoid region right here, you see the answer process, you see the osmotic complex right here. Now I'm going to be talking about uh, the retromaxillary cell. Uh, and as you see, we pretty much don't have any retromaxillary pneumatization here, but we have a little bit of a little bit of just one millimeter uh, uh, of pneumatization. You have six millimeter of pneumatization of the posterior ethmoids here. And then uh, the extreme type where you have more uh, lateral pneumatization of the posterior ethmoidal cells at the posterior superior corner of the maxillary sinus. So that's uh, uh, an important thing to recognize. Uh, so comparing this uh, cell to the Haller, again, this is the osmotic complex region, while we have the posterior ethmoid air cell and uh, uh, 
the retromaxillary cell lies right here at the posterior superior corner of the maxillary sinus. How this is important, you see that this is a revision case. And by the way, the revision case was, the case was done kind of very nicely, but the, the, the surgeon missed this cell. And uh, as, as, as you miss this cell, you actually miss the cell above it because you think this is the lamina papyrusia. And then uh, you end up by missing more and more cells. Again, this is a cell. And, uh, and then you have, you have actually, when, when you miss the retromaxillary cell, you end up with more disease in this region, which obstructs the posterior moiet and then obstructs as well the sphenoid sinus, uh, ostium, and the posterior groove of the sinuses in general. And then you end up by more disease. And this has been stressed in uh, the Australian group again after we published our, uh, uh, I think, lecture uh, by the end of two, in November 2016. They have came with also nice publication showing had have uh, how how this uh, cell is a risk factor for revision uh, endoscopic sinus surgery if you miss it. Uh, okay. I'm going to talk about the posterior moids uh, uh, more when, um, in, in a minute, uh, but also I'm going to talk about the maxillary uh, as a transition there. Now, you see this maxillary sinus? Let me ask you about this maxillary sinus. What do you think about this maxillary sinus is? I mean, why I'm presenting this is a lot of people, when I present this picture, they actually focus on the disease, so they mention that the patient has uh, left maxillary sinusitis and uh, you know they forget about mentioning that the patient has actually a hypoplastic maxillary sinus and the reason is you see the symmetry of the sinuses on both sides so you tend to forget that this patient uh, has a, a hypoplastic maxillary sinus and you just focus on the disease on the maxillary and how did I know that the patient has a hypoplastic maxillary sinus is by looking at the floor of the maxillary in all the cuts. So you see, in, the, in the, all the cuts, the floor of the maxillary sinus never crosses below, never actually crosses below uh, this, uh, you know, the line of the floor of the nose, this horizontal line. And then when you see this, see all the cuts, all the cuts, you, when you see this, you understand that this, this patient has a hypoplastic maxillary sinus, and then this example on both sides. Now, going to the sphenoid. Uh, I actually like to go to the sphenoid immediately after the posterior moid, since we need to focus on the forgotten turbinate. And this forgotten turbinate or the superior turbinate is something that we need to actually search for during endoscopic sinus surgery, even in the middle of the polyps. Even in the middle of the revision surgery, try to find your superior turbinate. It's a great landmark for you to tell you, well, first you need to preserve it, right? You need to preserve the superior turbinate, upper two thirds for sure, since you don't want to end with hyposmia for the patient, which is something that you cannot fix. Uh, so that's the, the first reason. The second is it's a great landmark for you to while you enter the sphenoid sinus. Now the class teaching is to have this uh, parallelogram or you know, uh, have this region lateral to the su superior turbinate. Obviously, we are now looking at the left side. And then you you say, okay, I'm going to have this line that divides uh, this rectangle into intermedial area and supralateral area. And obviously, uh, while entering the sphenoid sinus, you need to enter, if you are going trans ethmoidal, if you are going trans ethmoidal, if you are entering the sphenoid sinus, then you need to go through uh, the infru medial triangle, right? So this is going to be called the trans ethmoidal route. And then the other route for entering the sphenoid is going to be by entering uh, through, well, you remember, you know, no, well, I'm, I'm just going to actually, you know, the other way is to go trans nasal, medial to middle terminate, right? But indeed, uh, the, 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 the most, most of the times, the, the way that we enter the sphenoid sinus is neither by the trans route nor by the trans route. What we actually do is uh, we go and identify the superior turbinate, 
and then enter in the region between the posterior border of the middle turbinate, which is this, and see this, this region is very important. See this region is pretty important. You have a window that lies, that I just showed in the, in the first few images, a window that lies between the superior turbinate and the middle turbinate. But now I'm not looking at this window from the nasal view, I'm looking at it from the transethmoidal route, right? So now uh, you need, uh, I'm entering into this region and then it's just as if I were, as if I, I were uh, entering transnasally to identify uh, the opening of the sphenoid sinus just medial to the superior turbinate inferior third. So that's it. So I'm not going to be entering here. I'm not going to be entering here, obviously, through the superior turbinate upper, uh, uh, upper half. Um, I'm, I'm going to be entering through this region in most of the, of the cases. Remember, again, conquer plate should not be injured. Let me show you this, a live demonstration for this. Or I would say the record demonstration, but uh, a video demonstration. So you see, this is the posterior ethmoid region. And now I can enter through the posterior ethmoid right here in this info medial triangle. But uh, instead, I'm going to identify the superior turbinate and the region between, uh, the window between it and the posterior border of the middle turbinate. Uh, in this example, since this is a uh, allergic fungal rhinosinusitis case, I actually am planning to remove the inferior third of the superior turbinate. So this is what I'm doing right now, anyway. And then just by doing, you know, a little bit of trimming of this area, I entered into uh, the sphenoid sinus opening. Remember, now I'm shaving, but I'm not shaving inside the sphenoid sinus. I'm just shaving at the opening. And while you are shaving at the opening, remember, you can actually endanger um, the septal branch of the sphenobatine artery, but it's not a big deal, but you need to be prepared just in case you injure, you injure this. I actually prefer not to injure it at all by uh, dissecting the mucosa a little bit, but just it came, it came across in this case. So uh, in this scenario, I'm just, uh, see, I'm, I'm now trimming uh, uh, this area as well, trimming this area, and now uh, I'm, I'm removing the party wall between the posterior ethmoids and the sphenoid sinus. So I did not remove the superior turbinate upper half or upper two thirds. I just removed the very uh, lower portion that does not have that much of olfactory fibers and then the patient uh, would not end by hypoxia. That's the post-operative view. You would see that's the middle turbinate in view, a bit of antrostomy for this extensive allergic fungi sinusitis case, case, AFRS case. And you see the remaining part of the superior turbinate and the sphenoid uh, sinus opening right there, uh, posterior uh, ethmoid roof. See, this is the sphenoid sinus, obviously. That's the ICA. And uh, this is the posterior ethmoid roof. Uh, that's the posterior ethmoid artery. You see as well, all the way, all the way, we are going to uh, the frontal recess uh, region. And that's the area uh, of the maxillary sinus. Now, uh, when you Open the sphenoid very well. You might see the landmarks if the sphenoid is very well pneumatized. So that's, uh, uh, for example, in this case, this is uh, the cella. You have the ICA bulge, the paracellar region, and the paraclinoid portion as well. And then you have the optic nerve right uh, there. You have the OCR or the optical carotid recess. Uh, and um, that's obviously uh, the area where the anterior wall of the sphenoid was. And this is... Uh, uh, the area of the bulge for, you know this? Okay, try to think, the cavernous sinus bulge uh, right right here. And then uh, that's uh, a retromaxillary area uh, of pneumatization in uh, the posterior ethmoid uh, cells. Uh, sinoid landmarks is something that we have, uh, I think we have uh, like back in 2007, we have, the, you know, uh, spent so much time in describing the sphenoid landmarks in different case scenarios and the variations that you would see with the internal carotid artery uh, course in this region, and the things that you would uh, see in the cavernous sinus as well. That's beyond, of course, the endoscopic sinus surgery, but just came across uh, uh, this presentation. So I'm mentioning about all the dif details that you need to be aware of in the lateral wall uh, of the sphenoid sinus. Uh, uh, looking into the sphenoid sinus, 
landmarks, remember, you have uh, certain foramina that are important. I'm going to show you one important, for example, variation that you can see in, 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 in your cases. So obviously, uh, this is the foramen rotundum, uh, and uh, you have, this is the, the really big Vidian canal, and uh, you have the lateral sphenodrisis right here. Lateral sphenodrisis is even bigger and clearer uh, on this side. I see the, the uh, V2, the V2 canal, foramen rotundum anteriorly, and then uh, the Vidian. Uh, see, it can, the over pneumatization can put the nervous structures at risk. So you see this is uh, dehiscent Vidian, uh, can be dehiscent optic, see the optic in the middle of the field, and then you see the, this pneumatization into the anterior clinoid process. Uh, that uh, by, I, I think I, uh, I think maybe a couple of months back we have uh, demonstrated a case on my timeline showing a case with a really big pneumatization of the anterior clinoid process that holded a lot of allergic fungi sinusitis, and the optic nerve was pretty much compressed and the patient had, uh, uh, I think she had like hand movement uh, and uh, you have to be very careful, very careful operating these cases because you are going to be working around the optic nerve floating inside the AFRS or the polyps and alhamdulillah luckily uh, the patient went fine, the patient had regained her vision, uh, her father was just talking to me a uh, couple of days back uh, since we are in the middle of the corona issue so he's asking about the follow-up uh, and so on. Sphenoid floor foramina can be, see, I'm going to show you this example. Oh, okay, so this video is actually not working. Okay, so anyway. Okay, yeah, so that, that's actually, oh yeah. So that's uh, one of the cases that I was operating and you see, um, the Vidian canal was actually lying in a in a bony mesentery. You see the, this bony mesentery, and you see you have you have this Vidian canal, and you have also the hesin, the hesins on the V2 as well, uh, just in the floor of the cavernous sinus. And uh, you need to be very careful operating such a case because what happens is, if you are widening the sphenoid sinus, taking down this bony mesentery, you actually will end by having uh, injury for the Vidian canal and then the patient will have a dry eye. And by the way, this was a revision case, was the ninth revision. Well, uh, no, that was actually not the revision case. That was a different scenario. But I remember this case. Um, so we, we have actually paid attention to, to this patient where we uh, identified the Vidian canal like in this bony entry and then uh, we saved the, the Vidian canal. But I remember another case, uh, probably that was the case where uh, the video was not working. Uh, not sure if it's working. Okay, it's not working. So there was another case uh, where we had a dehiscent Vidian, and in the middle of the field was, was her ninth revision, and then the patient ended with a dry eye for like nine months since the Vidian uh, uh, was was injured, um, and uh, the patient luckily again regained her her tearing. But it, it really was a stressful time for her and for me as well. Uh, but was her like tenth or ninth or tenth revision, and uh, was extremely like extremely extremely uh, distorted uh, anatomy for for this region. Now for the sphenoid um, sinus anatomy as well, it's important to remember that you can have asymmetry in the sphenoid sinus. See, see the septum? So now, now literally, I'm, you know, now what, what, I'm, what I'm going through right now is I'm entering through the left side of the nose, but when I enter into the sphenoid sinus through the left side of the nose, I'm actually entering into the right side sphenoid. And why is that? Because there is asymmetry of the sphenoid sinus septum, so you need to remember this. This happens a lot with our residents so that they enter into the other side. And then if you just enter here and you think we are done, you are actually missing this, the true left sphenoid sinus on this side. And if you if you have disease in this case, obviously this is, it doesn't have a disease, so it's not a big deal. But if you have disease in this case, then you can uh, miss it. Sphenoid septations also attached to the landmarks, well-known fact. 
uh, uh, in this example, attach it to the internal cord artery. It can be attached to the optic nerve. Uh, uh, also, the sphenoid septations can create for you some cells, whether they are cells over the clivus, by the way, or they are cells uh, above uh, uh, above the sphenoid, uh, like the onodi cell is important to recognize in order to clear them if they have disease. Again, uh, dehiscent optic nerve in the, inside the onodi cell. As you enter anterior thmoids, posterior thmoids, sphenoid sinus, now uh, you have a very much easier way to go from posterior to anterior along the skull base and uh, clear this. Let me show you this. So that's now I enter the sphenoid sinus. Uh, anterior thmoids and posterior thmoids are partially clear, not fully clear. So I'm now I'm now going to clear the cells on the skull base, starting from the sphenoid sinus posteriorly, uh, and uh, going anteriorly over the posterior thmoids and then the anterior thmoids. Right here, I'm starting taking it down cell by cell uh, over the skull base, uh, uh, the skull base of the posterior thmoid, skull base. Uh, uh, and then the skull base on the anterior thmoid and the cells on the lamina papyrusia as well. So taking them carefully from posterior to anterior uh, in order to clear all the disease uh, of the patient. As you see, from so I'm, I'm telling from the sphenoid to see thmoid going, as you see, the navigation is showing you where exactly you are going all the way to the uh, frontal recess region. And as you see postoperatively, you see the remaining part of the superior tablet, all the cells uh, over uh, uh, the skull base are clear. Uh, well, the sphenoid, as we just described, has important landmarks to the optic and to the ICA. This is an example of a patient that had not just optic compression with, uh, she was having optic atrophy, optic compression, and she was having uh, pretty much hand movement or even uh, there was just perception of light on the left side and uh, also compression on the internal cord artery as well. And you need to be very careful, very careful again, looking into these patients and operating them. Uh, in this example, I'm using the navigation as well, interoperative navigation. Uh, uh, MRI was done as well for the patient in order. Let me show you the MRI. So you see the MRI, the internal cord artery. So you see, okay. So that you see, as you see, the MRI is also showing the internal cord artery pretty much uh, not in the middle of the field, but you know, in your like margin, like you, 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 you will touch the internal cord artery. I'm going to show you the interoperative scenario right now. So you see the internal cord artery right here, uh, and uh, all, obviously all the investigations has been done for the patient, whether it's ophthalmology, MRI, uh, you know, uh, full assessment. Uh, in order to see, this is. So that's, that's the area where you see allergic mucin, and then you see the internal cord artery turn, the C turn over here. Uh, see, this is the allergic mucin, and I'm going to show you also the ICA uh, right there. So the ICA is going to, so that is the ICA on the other one side, and this is the ICA. And remember, why I'm, I'm showing you this, because this patient has perception of light or uh, probably hand movement, and the patient needs a full clearance of her allergic mucin in this region, you can't just go there and, and leave this behind because this is the target, this is the aim of the operation, is to clear all this allergic mucin from this region for the patient to have hope of regaining her vision. Uh, so, you know, uh, what I've done is done extended sphenotomy, uh, posterior septectomy, doing pretty much what you do for a pituitary surgery, and then clearing all the cells inside the sphenoid uh, sinus. And I'm going to show you this region. So you see, I'm, I'm now working at the very narrow area that I showed you in the CT and the MRI scan on the left side. And uh, I'm taking down this region. Uh, while I'm taking down, I think I'm going to have injury again of some, uh, you see, you'd see, uh, let me show you. So while taking the septum down, uh, um, I think I'm going to also, again, injuring one of branches, probably of the septal branch of the sphenobatine artery, again, uh, getting uh, the, by, in this example, the bovi or the suction diaphermy, very carefully, you should be, you see, the IC is just back there, right? So you need to be very uh, careful. 
and then okay let me just okay clearing this region and again see uh, now i'm showing you see can you see this band probably some of you will now will start can you imagine just you are inside the surgery and you know this and you know this patient has a, a perception of light she has severe deterioration of her vision what exactly is this band in the middle of the field but you need to be very careful working around your landmarks just brainstorming what exactly this band is going to be uh, well I, I i put all the scenarios what what this can be but you see this mucosa right here but you know you know the anatomy if you're from your ct and mri you have also the navigation there uh, but you see that this seems like a mucosal band uh, the mucosa on this the left side uh, of the septum that has uh, you, you, as you remember we have a very narrow left side on the sphenoid sinus and we have this mucosal band on uh, the left side of the septum so i'm now clearing so i'm now clearing it see but by the way once this was cut i, I was like oh it looks scary since it's very tough band out of the chronicity uh, of the disease that the patient has had and now i'm clearing uh taking down the septum again and uh, um, i know i'm pretty close to the dehiscent optic and the dehiscent uh, carotid artery and you see this allergic mucin that's pressing on the optic nerve up there and this has just so much pressure with the so much disease that the patient had uh pressing on on the optic nerve right there and then uh, this all was cleared out and uh, i'm going to show you the post-operative picture for the patient see that can you see the pulsa pulsations of the of the dura right here of the cella pulsations of the ica and the optic uh, nerve i'm, I'm going to show you the post-operative result which shows you clearly what exactly you have you have it by the way this is a, a partial middle metal uh, sorry middle turbinectomy a partial one to allow the post-operative irrigations to reach this region very well and see this is the extended sphenotomy right there and uh, uh, you see that's the dehiscent ICA pulsating and you see the, in the cella you see the optic nerve right there the OCR uh, uh, this region is pretty much clear and by the way the patient has regained almost almost uh, full her you know uh, most of her vision uh, she had still remaining a little bit of blind spots in the field like uh, in the visual field but the patient was extremely uh, happy almost you know sees like normal and uh, 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 was really exciting uh, case uh, uh, that's one of the th quiz that we do while doing the dissection uh, so I'm pretty sure now you can spot this is uh, the cella that's the ICA uh, optic nerve OCR is going to be here you have uh, a septum on this side on the right side that does not make the paracellar ICA pretty clear uh, by this is the clivus this is the paraclival uh, ICA on this side paraclival ICA on the other side uh, cella again okay now we go to the frontal well going to the frontal uh, uh, I'm going to ask you a question and uh, hopefully I'm going to see you your answer. I'm going to give you one minute to answer this question before I give the answer. So the frontal, can you summarize the frontal in two words? And uh, I'm going to look at the comments later during uh, um, my review of the lecture later, but just try to summarize the frontal in two words. If you can put some like uh, comment on the video two words to summarize the front end. and I have it summarized in two words and then we are going to move forward so hopefully by now I'm not sure how much lag do I do I have and how much uh, time did you have to uh, uh, like I'm not sure how the lag is going to work with you guys uh, but now let's see so the two words summarizing the frontal is it's a separate lecture. I simply cannot, you know, summarize the frontal in, in two words. And uh, I simply cannot mention the frontal among all these details that we are discussing in, uh, you know, the Landmarks lecture. So it's, it's basically a separate lecture. So much detail in there, uh, so much, you know, Landmarks in the, uh, about the frontal and, you know, so much demonstrations 
that we need to go through in the frontal that deserves to be a separate lecture. Uh, you know, that hopefully when we see some of you in our uh, courses or maybe in, in one of the meetings, we can uh, go through uh, the frontal in more detail. Now, for the ethmoid arteries. For uh, the ethmoid arteries, uh, the anterior ethmoid artery lies in a bony mesentery in, uh, in, in one third of cases. So, which means in two thirds of cases, it's gonna be lying in the skull base, right? But in one third of cases, it's gonna be below the skull base, in one to, to eight millimeter below the skull base. And uh, uh, that's an example where you have a tooth mode artery lying below the skull base. Let me show you this. Uh, what, is, what is the uh, anatomical variation that's gonna actually make you predict that the tooth mode artery is lying below the skull base in when you have a supraorbital pneumatization. So a supraorbital pneumatization, pretty much in most of these cases, you will have uh, the anterior mode artery lying below the skull base. Again, in this example I'm showing you is a supraorbital pneumatization right here, uh, and the anterior mode artery is lying below uh, the skull base. And let me show you this example. Now, I'm going to show you this example because this is the scenario uh, that I actually find most dangerous. So, uh, you know, most of our residents know that the anterior mode artery can be lying below the skull base in one to third, third of cases. So they review the anterior mode artery before, before they go to the operation and they, they see the nipple sign, you know, you know the, uh, the nipple sign. Uh, see, I'm, I'm pretty sure you see the nipple sign right here. Uh, this nipple that lies between the superior oblique muscle and the medial rectus muscle. So they search for this. But what you guys don't search for at times is a dehiscent anterior mode artery, which can be lying at the skull base. And this is more, the, the, more the, in, in my opinion, the most dangerous scenario because you are not prepared. And uh, I'm not just not, not just my opinion. I have seen in my career two cases of anterior mode artery injury. Fortunately, not done by me, but they are actually referred to our institution where they had previous history of anterior ethmoid artery injury intraoperatively, and then they are coming to our uh, uh, institution to make to have the, uh, the revision in scopic sinus surgery done since it was not completed in the first surgeon. Uh, obviously, in the middle of the anterior ethmoid artery injury, the first surgeon just stopped. And I have reviewed both cases, uh, and uh, you know, you would see, I have reviewed actually the preoperative uh, uh, CT images for both patients and find them pretty much looking in the same way that I'm going to show you right now, uh, looking something like this. And what is that is that's an anterior ethmoid artery lying in the skull base, but with eroded bone. Like you don't see bone below the anterior ethmoid artery in the skull base. Uh, and that's, that's, in my opinion, the most dangerous scenario. See? See, uh, it's it's a little. You don't have anterior mode uh, and a supraorbital pneumatization. You have an anterior mode artery region that's pretty much having no bone here, right here, and uh, uh, you know, then the patient can very easily have injury of the anterior mode artery uh, during surgery. Uh, so we have this is the patient that that was a fresh patient that was not a revision case. Uh, so I'm just showing you how the field is gonna appear intraoperatively. So th this is the same patient. A same patient, uh, I'm, I'm gonna be showing you, so the, again, this is not a revision surgery, this is a fresh case. Patient did not have anterior ethmoid artery injury. I'm gonna show you how the field looks like intraoperatively and how it's very likely, you know, or, or you know, very risky while you are operating such a case. So that's the left side. That's the posterior ethmoid artery, also dehiscent, very clearly appearing in the field. And then you have the skull base between the anterior and the posterior and the anterior ethmoid artery. And then you have the anterior ethmoid artery right there, just in the field. It's just in the field. You remove the polyps, it's in the middle of everything. And then uh, you have uh, the first fovea, uh, the space between the anterior ethmoid artery right there and the posterior table of the frontal. And uh, again, I'm just showing uh, this region. See, I'm just putting the suction around, uh, but 
the, the key is identifying the anterior ethmoid artery when it's nascent in the middle of disease. So that's it. Uh, uh, you know, that's the anterior ethmoid artery. See, that's in the patient. That's the anterior ethmoid artery lesion. And you see, this is the first fovea, uh, the space between or the roof of the suprabolar cell, right? So it's the roof of the suprabolar cell. Uh, and then you have the posterior table of the frontal uh, right there. The posterior ethmoid artery is pretty much most of the cases in the skull base, 98%. Uh, but then in 2% of the cases, you might find it uh, below the skull base. Again, that's when you have a posterior ethmoid supraorbital pneumatization, uh, uh, like in this example. Pretty uh, uh, uncommon, but you have to pay attention to as well uh, in your cases. That's a, uh, that's a demonstration of a post-operative case showing you everything opened up uh, and what you need to have in your pilot cases, AFR cases, revision cases, pretty much clearing everything and opening things uh, uh, up wide. Let me show you. So that's the left side. That's the middle terminate trimmed in order to be nice looking, not starting the airway. That's the superior terminate. Uh, the inferior third was removed. So, uh, and this is the sphenoid sinus opening. Uh, that's um, uh, the, the roof of the posterior ethmoids right here. This is the posterior ethmoid artery, again appearing in this case, anterior ethmoid artery, and the space in between them. This is the, again uh, the first fovea, and then you have uh, the posterior table of the frontal, the frontal recess. That's the lamina papyrusia. And let me show you on this, on this side. Uh, I, I see this region? So this is our cell, right? So this is our cell that uh, uh, we described, I, I like to focus on this because remember, again, I'm showing you this retromaxillary cell uh, and this is the lamina papyrusia right here. Remember, if I would have missed this cell, now let me show you what's gonna happen. Uh, if I would have missed this cell, I would have a cell right here, which means I'm gonna be having a cell right here over the lamina and then which means that this, that this area of the posterior ethmoid would not, wouldn't be clear and then you would have uh, this area harboring disease that's going to form polyps and the polyps is going to come over the frontal sinus ostium, sorry, the, the sphenoid sinus ostium, and then you end up with, uh, uh, you know, uh, obstructing the posterior ethmoid, the, the sphenoid, the posterior sinus group uh, with a disease, and then the patient ends up with recurrent disease. Uh, so again, uh, the cell and the uh, Showing you this again. I, by the way, I have a separate lecture describing the posterior ethmoids, how to you know work on this on this region and the relationship between the posterior ethmoids and the maxillary sinus in what we call the ethmomaxillary crest, and how is that important in clearing the cell of the. But that, that's a that's a long story uh, in a, in a separate lecture. Again, on the other side now we have uh, the sphenoid sinus, the superior terminate upper two thirds. We have the Skull base, uh, a band here. See, this is the anterior ethmoid artery. A band in front of the anterior ethmoid artery that I have missed, but unfortunately, you don't have any like uh, complete partition that's going to harbor disease. Again, the retromaxillary cell, uh, uh, you can call it Herzala cell. Uh, I like that name, of course. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, again, that's the cell. And, and then uh, the middle metal, the middle metal uh, anterostomy. Uh, lastly, before you go for surgery and before you finish your surgery as well, you need to review the septum, the turbinate, and the nasopharynx. Septum, since you, you might end up, you know, doing all the surgery, right? You clear everything, you clear the frontal, you do everything, but then you miss uh, a septal deviation uh, in the middle of the disease. Uh, or you get tired or something and you don't work on, on, on this appropriately, so that it's going to end up by recurrent nasal obstruction and then you would need to operate the patient uh, again, which is something you, you don't want to go through. Uh, uh, so if you if you just, you just need to review the septum, and obviously the septum itself, if you do the septoplasty, is also going to help you uh, work on the sinuses, especially if it's obstructing uh, the sinuses enough to prevent you from working on the sinuses in the proper way. So the septum. 
the turbinate, the turbinate, uh, again, I have, uh, uh, I was in Rhino Egypt uh, this last March, and we have a separate lecture on the middle turbinate, right? We have, a, we had a separate lecture on how to deal with the middle turbinate in endoscopic sinus surgery. Uh, it's a, again, there are so many examples on what to do with, with every scenario, uh, but just one example is the concave loser. Uh, uh, why I'm mentioning this? Because it's pretty common to have a, con you know, remember, concave loser is pretty, in pretty much like, you know, 20% uh, uh, of cases, of normal cases, right? So you should expect to have a concave loser in the middle of the diseased cases as well. And the patient is not coming for uh, concave loser, the patient's coming for the polyps. So, Surgeons tend to miss uh, the concave loza in the middle. They are, I'm not talking out of like just uh, cases that we see, out of even publications showing the percentage of concave loza in revision cases where the surgeon had missed, uh, where the surgeon has, you know, had missed, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, the concave loza in the first surgeon. And uh, by the way, this is an example where I'm asking my when I'm asking my resident to work on the case. And uh, he was like, okay, uh, he's trying to get into the middle meters, work, identify the answer process, and uh, start removing the polyps doing the middle meter antrostomy. And he's like stuck, trying to lateralize, uh, sorry, medialize the middle terminate to get into the space. But but he can do it. Skip like for five to 10 minutes trying to, you know, do it appropriately. And I'm like, listen, if you don't remember, if you don't review the CT scan and you see that there is a concave loza in the middle of the polyps, you need to see it very, you know, it's, it's sometimes hard to identify it, but you need to go through all the cuts to see it. Uh, 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 unless you do this, you, will, you, you wouldn't understand that this is not just a polyp, it's a concave loza that you need to work on. And uh, once you open the concave loza, uh, do it very well, you, you see a nice, wide middle, uh, middle meatus uh, right now, and then you can do uh, the maxillary antrostomy, uh, identify the answer process right there, and do the maxillary antrostomy uh, very easily now. Even another example for uh, working with the middle turnit, again, I'm telling you there are so many different scenarios that it's a separate lecture, but middle, 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 middle turnit partial resection is another option, and middle turnit partial resection is helpful in certain cases. Uh, it, it actually can help olfaction because it prevents all the disease reforming polyps from obstructing the olfactory cleft, but it has to be done very, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a good fashion. Uh, you need to, you, you don't need to be aggressive. It has to be done for selected cases uh, and the middle, middle terminal partial resection uh, uh, is helpful in, in such cases. Uh, in, in such extensive cases. Uh, the last thing is to review the nasopharynx. Uh, since the nasopharynx can, has, can have adenoids, right? The patient can have adenoids and you do all the, the work nicely, the, the, the septum, uh, the polyps, the disease, and then you miss adenoids in the nasopharynx and then the patient comes with recurrent nasal obstruction uh, again. So uh, just to review, take home messages. The cribriform plate is not just the key, is remember the medial orbital floor where you have different variations. Remember the number 14 millimeter plus minus three standard deviation. The lamina preparation or just the head sense. Remember the types that we described uh, back five years ago, uh, uh, you know, the types type one, type two, type three, and the implication of each type on your case. Remember uh, uh, the cells in the osmeter complex, the onodi cell, and also, uh, our cell or the retromaxillary cell where you can have disease and needs to be uh, uh, taken care of. The sinuses, remember the forgotten details that we mentioned uh, in, in the sphenoid sinus, in the maxillary hypoplasia. Uh, sorry about the frontal, the frontal has to be a separate one. It's one hour separate. Remember the ethmoid arteries uh, where you have not just the, the lying down ethmoid artery, but also the dehiscent anterior ethmoid artery. Uh, and remember to review the septum, the terminates, and the nasopharynx. Use the closer in your patients. Teach it to your staff, to teach it to your residents. Uh, it's something that if you use every single one of these letters and go through all the details that the, the letters tells you, uh, 
uh, you know, it's going to help you uh, review the CT scan very well, and you will have a map in your mind uh, in order to get into the surgery, knowing exactly what you are working on. People tend to see the disease only, like tend to see, okay, the patient has posthumoid disease, and tooth disease, frontal disease, tend to see certain details in the CT about like, you know, uh, and with more artery, you know, uh, tend to know, to see whether, whether there's the essence in the skull base or the essence in the lamina, and they tend to forget all the other details if you if they are not reviewing it in a systematic way, uh, and I like uh, the acronym uh, CLOSER uh, for this. So look closer, uh, uh, hopefully you will stay uh, safe and effective. Uh, I'm missing my colleagues in, in Zarezek, of course, um, by the way, I'm now in King Abdullah Medical City for the last six years. King Abdullah Medical City, uh, by the way, King Abdullah, sorry. Uh, okay, so King Abdullah Medical City, oops, I have to, so I actually, so I've been working in, in King Abdullah Medical City in Mecca uh, uh, in, for the past uh, six years. We have a set of subspecialties, rhinology, head and neck, uh, uh, facial uh, plastic and otology lateral skull base as well uh, and this subspeciality based career or subspeciality based practice is actually one of the things that's going to help you develop a lot of skills uh, and uh, a lot of details in uh, uh, your uh, career uh, and uh, uh, but I'm missing my uh, colleagues and my friends my brothers in uh, uh, Zagas University and all my colleagues in Egypt of course, and uh, uh, you know, I'm very happy to have this lecture today for all of you guys. I hope my like everything went fine. Uh, the streaming was clear. Uh, hopefully, things you know from the technical point of view uh, was fine. Hopefully, the presentation itself was uh, you know uh, helpful for you guys in your uh, perhaps in the future, inshallah. Uh, uh, it was uh, you know very nice you know talking together. Uh, well, actually, there is no interaction, but I'm going to have a look at your uh, comments in, in, in the section, inshallah, and see uh, uh, how much it, you know, matches your uh, expectations and what exactly you need in the future, inshallah. Uh, and uh, this is the holy city of Mecca. We are, uh, it's very, uh, like, heart-touching not to have access right now to all the holy area of the holy mosque. Uh, but uh, inshallah things will settle down soon uh, and uh, inshallah you, you will come for Umrah as well everything inshallah is going to be fine in the near future uh, right now everybody I'm pretty sure everyone is having difficult time with this uh, COVID-19 thing and uh, inshallah things will get better soon and we'll have we will go back to our normal lectures where we have uh, not just the lecture broadcasting but we have much better face-to-face -face communication uh, interaction, social, uh, uh, you know, you know, interaction is uh, is. I think uh, you know, apart from uh, the scientific point of view or the scientific thing, the social things that we have in the meetings uh, is a lot more exciting uh, than just a broadcasting. So, inshallah, we'll touch, we will catch up together soon. And uh, again, reminding you that uh, sorry, I didn't put a, a slide for this in my presentation, but let me tell you something. Middle East Academy of Autolaryngology meeting that I have the honor to be handling, to be taken care of uh, for the last four years in Dubai. Uh, the Middle East Academy, uh, I'm taking care of just the rhinology portion. Uh, so the rhinology portion or the rhinology section or the rhinology track in the Middle East Academy uh, is something that we have been keen to be a major part in the meeting and to be distinguished last year we had 35 speakers all of them had outstanding input in the meeting uh, from the, they were from 15 different countries and this year inshallah is going to be in october five to seven sorry i did not put a slide i should have uh, done that uh let me check maybe i missed the slide but it's not there uh, but it's uh it's going to be five to seven october 2020 5 to 7 October 2020. That's going to be the Middle East Academy of Autolaryngology in Dubai. Again, the rhinology section is going to have 
35 speakers again they're again from almost 14 countries this year uh, uh, you know you you will see a very rich program uh, with um, unedited recordings for uh, you know surgical true not just dissections some are dissections but also unedited surgical or many many edited surgical videos uh, section you know sessions like uh, 30, 30 to 45 minutes where you have uh, our distinguished speakers talking about uh, you know uh, some skull based cases or some extended sinus surgery cases showing you on edited videos in these sections and describing what they need to describe on these videos uh, in addition to the instruction courses that Uh, uh, we will see you there, and you, you know, I'm pretty sure you should have uh, all the uh, eager to go out of your homes uh, after this Corona uh, COVID-19 thing, and then hopefully the first thing you are going to think about is uh, coming to Dubai for this meeting. Uh, thank you, thank you, and uh, now I'm looking forward to uh, to see the whole thing on uh, uh, on the on the group. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, see all of you, inshallah, soon. Thank you.